Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Our research colleagues from universities, departmental staff and key stakeholders, today's research forum on learning to connect and care plays responsive pedagogy. To be presented today by Professor Peter Renshaw and Dr Ron Tooth. And speaking of connection to place, I wish to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we gather today, the Turbal and Yuggera people, and recognise that this has always been a place of teaching and learning. I wish to pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in the education and research community. Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. Could you please have your mobile phones on silent? Um, the bathrooms are located on the other side of the lift foyer should you need to use them. And in the event of an emergency, we are also to congregate on the other side of the lift foyer. Today's forum is being web conferenced through the department's learning place. And I extend a warm welcome to staff and stakeholders who are watching the forum today online. This web conference recording will be available on our website within a few weeks. So please pass on to your colleagues who might wish to attend today that they'll be able to access the recording after the event. Our ne next forum, as shown on the slide, and I'll just go back to that for you, um, is titled Our Stories, Our Way, Cultural Identities and Health and Wellbeing of Indigenous Young People in Diverse School Settings. And it'll feature a presentation from Associate Professor Grace Sara and Professor Anne Edwards from the QUT, and they'll be joined by Dr. Marnie Shane from the University of Queensland, and that's on the 14th of June. Um, they'll also be joined by staff at the school in which this student voice driven research um, occurred. I encourage you to register for that forum. Turning to today's presentation on learning to connect and care. Professor Renshaw and Dr. Tu will provide an overview of the findings from their research undertaken in Queensland's network of 25 environmental and outdoor education centres. This research posed a question, how can the insights and practices documented in the environmental education centres be designed for schools and regular classrooms? This is critical in the current age of disconnection and a very practical question for teachers who are challenged every day to engage their students in learning. It's also more broadly a global priority for the next generation to take leadership in caring for our environment and reversing the impacts of human construction and habitation. Today we will hear how educators can apply place responsive pedagogy to motivate students to become engaged and care rather than disengaged, sceptical and despondent. This research into environmental education centres offers policy officers, school leaders and practitioners with evidence for responsive pedagogies that have been shown to engage students and teachers and heighten their commitment to caring positively about each other and the places around them. So it is with pleasure that I introduce Professor Peter Renshaw, former head of the School of Education at the University of Queensland, and a leading researcher in place responsive pedagogy and children's emotional engagements with the more than human world. Earlier this year, he was successfully awarded an ARC Discovery Grant with Dr. Ron Tooth and Professor Christina Kumpelang, thank you, <laughs> from Helsinki, um, to research how children use digital technology during environmental excursions to record and remember emotional experiences. Perhaps we will hear of this project in a future forum. And Dr. Ron Tooth is the principal of the Pullen Vale Environmental Education Centre and a leader in environmental education and research. Ron is the architect of Story Thread Pedagogy, which he designed over many years and researched in his doctoral thesis. He engages with teachers and students through the Pullen Vale Environmental Education Centre, focusing particularly on forms of narrative and place based pedagogy. He is an adjunct professor in the School of Education at the University of Queensland. As we are web conferencing today, we'll leave most audience questions to the end of the presentation, but do feel free to put up your hand should you have a burning question along the way. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Ron. 
today is uh, the first day of National Reconciliation Week, as hopefully most of you know. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the custodians, but in particular the elders that we work with, um, Auntie Peggy and Uncle Nerdon and Uncle James Sandy and Uncle Albert, who um, have had a massive impact on our work at Pullen Vale and in many ways wouldn't be presenting this today in the way we are without the ongoing dialogue with those elders. So. I really want to acknowledge them. We chose to uh, take this idea of learning to connect and care as the focus of our time together with you today. <clears throat> I think it's right in terms of what we just heard. Yes, we are in the age of the great disconnection. And Johan Harry um, talks about disconnection from meaningful work, disconnection from values, dis disconnection from people, and most of all, disconnection from the natural world. Uh, these are major issues and we believe they're major educational issues as well as societal issues. Uh, there's a recognition that there are rising levels of anxiety in our young children and in our teachers. Uh, there's a recognition that we need a more holistic or a return to um, the whole idea of well-being and which is becoming more topical now, thank goodness, and humanity in our education of putting community and relationships back at the centre of what we do. Uh, but to do this, we need a pedagogy of connection and care and of people. Um, so where do we get that? And are there models that we can turn to? Are there models we can look at? Well, the, the models that I know most and the ones that I think are a great place to start are, are our own 25 environmental edu and uh, outdoor education centres in the state. And that's where we're going to start. So I'll hand over to you, Peter. ...research done in Queensland over the last uh, two decades, looking at issues of place, pedagogy, how you can connect to the local place. We're working with the idea of place responsive. Um, and I guess what we want to say is that by working in the local area, connecting with local sites, um, getting relevance at the centre of education doesn't make it kind of parochial. So to, to connect to the local is also to make those connections into the globe. So we see the notion of place responsive as a particular approach at the current moment that allows children to learn about the bigger picture by focusing much more on the local situation. One of the things that struck me when I started to work with Ron was um, how um, Queensland had this jewel within its education system, which is the 25 outdoor and environmental education centres. So um, we uh, co-authored a book, uh, also with Sue, who's in the room, with a number of other environmental educators. Um, and in writing that book, we looked back through the history of these environmental and outdoor education centres. So it's worthwhile, I think, just going back briefly and having a look at this idea because um, I think they, they represent a lot of the kind of learning that we value today and that we're seeing education systems kind of return to. So they emerged from the Agricultural Project Club branch, which there was actually a branch in Education Queensland called this, um, are very much based on Dewey's idea of learning by doing it was experiential and apprenticeship type learning and it occurred in the local and regional areas. The interesting thing about many of the environmental and outdoor education centres is they emerged from um, places that had been uh, already used, so timber had been cut, the forest was exhausted and so they had this um, infrastructure in those places and they said what are we going to do with this? So one of the ideas was to then make them into um, environmental education centres. So it's paradoxical that we kind of exploited the natural world <coughs> and then thought, oh, what are we going to do with these leftover buildings? Oh, we'll make them into an environmental education centre. So that, I think, is a very interesting idea that surplus to need a turn back to education. Another important aspect there was the way that the initial principles of these environmental education centres really merged professional and personal life. That was very committed to this whole idea of education. And
and so they would get together a couple of times a year, they would share experiences, tell us what you're doing, how are you developing your centre, <coughs> what are your professional practices. So there was this real sense of building a professional community about issues that were really important that they saw as crucial. And I think we see these issues as crucial at the moment. But it was maybe a different era in education where people were expected to innovate. There wasn't so much of a top-down pressure um, and people kind of built things from the ground up. So that notion of there was innovation, trust and freedom to experiment. The other thing, that I think the environmental education centres did become community centres. So they often were used by advocacy groups um, to come together um, and to work for local issues that were important. So I think they, they represent a, a kind of vision of how education might work, both innovative, building from the grassroots up, but also building out into the community. So in terms of place responsive pedagogy, these are the um, research projects that um, have been conducted over the last couple of decades. Starting with the first one, which was um, Roy Valentine and Janet Packer, who began research in the early 2000s. And it was the time where uh, productive pedagogies had just become a large innovation in Queensland. And so, Productive Pedagogies was introduced as a way of responding to the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, it was rolled out at a, a number of schools, and I guess many of you remember it. Um, I think it's still up on the website as an option in pedagogy. Well, Roy Valentine, who was an environmental education researcher, he was very interested in the environmental education centres and thought maybe this offers a different vision of what a pedagogy could be. And so by going out and looking at quite a number of the environmental education centres, he came up with the idea of the fifth pedagogy, the four others being part of productive pedagogies. And so this was a pedagogy beyond the classroom, a pedagogy that involved children in experiential learning, in inquiry, in bodily engagement, and learning through the body. And so, um, by going around, <coughs> observing, looking at outcomes for children, and trying to sum up, what, was, what were the things that these outdoor and environmental education centers offered? And so he called it the fifth pedagogy. But one of the things that he noted was this notion of deep reflective responding. So that when children went out on these excursions they inquired. One of the activities that he was very impressed by was this notion of children sitting quietly, attentively in the environment. Um, and of course, when you go out into these natural places, that's one of the things that is offered to you, a place of, of reflection, of feeling more connected with nature but he, he definitely felt that this was one of the, the key pedagogies of this fifth pedagogy, of being able to sit quietly, attend to and connect with your surroundings. The other idea, of course, was just connecting to place, um, learning about place. Um, in the conversations we were having just before we began, um, somebody was saying that children um, who come to recreation centres often still are quite frightened and anxious about being in touch with nature. And so the idea of providing a space where people connect is really important. So Ron and I followed that project up, um, but we were very much more interested in, I guess Roy did a more survey kind of um, research project, looking across the centres and looking at what they had in common and making some sort of broader comments about that. What we were interested in was the much more place-specific pedagogy. So we were looking not just at what they had in common, but kind of what they offered distinctively in each of the centres. Because we had this sense that these people had developed these ideas over a period of time. 
they'd actually been very closely connected to their own places. So one of the things when we went around and interviewed the principals and the teachers of these environmental ed centres was that we found that they are often spend childhoods in contact with that place. They often have a special empathy with the place. They had learned about the place. Um, one of the principals at Luma remembers almost drowning in one of the creeks as a child when she was four years old and her grandmother had to dive in and get her out. She also remembers meeting her future husband on an excursion there. So I think there's too much detail about that. But you do get the sense that, you know, they have lived their lives in close connection to the places. And through this, we got the sense that they knew something about the place in depth. They could understand it pedagogically, if you like. They knew where to go, where their children could be engaged. They could tell stories to the children about these places. So we think that um, it's very important to look at the mediating role of teachers with regard to the kinds of pedagogy that develop in these places. I think place doesn't teach by itself in one way. It can, but you need hooks, you need ways into it. Your relationship to it initially needs to be scaffolded in some way. So out of that um, ARC project, uh, we wrote a book on diverse pedagogies in place. As we said, trying to capture the unique affordances of each centre. What could be learned here and nowhere else? I like that kind of questioning. So when you think about affordance of place, you say there's something here the children could actually learn that they could possibly learn somewhere else, but it's unlikely. This place offers this particular affordance. And um, that's why it's so powerful. So we had begun this idea we were going to document the pedagogical tools that people deployed. And when we started to get the data in and looking at the data, we began to think, well, it's starting to look as though every centre's a little bit the same. We weren't getting that uniqueness that we were looking for, the distinctiveness of each centre. So we then asked the question, tell us about key moments where deep learning occurred. And I remember um, we went, one of our first visits was actually to Sue at Baramba. So Sue Gibson is uh, principal of Baramba Environmental Education Centre. And she had collected a lot of data on the children who came to Baramba to go on excursions there, walk through the forest, walk through the creek, um, do indigenous, cultural programs and so on. And we were sitting one day with Sue and we said, you know, tell us, tell us about the kinds of unique, deep moments of learning that occur. And she began talking about a walking, talking pedagogy that she had designed at Baramba. And we thought, that's it. That's the thing about Baramba. There's something in the pedagogy at Baramba that really centers on this idea of walking in a place and connecting to that place through walking. So that was one of the really, really good insights, I think. And we felt now we're on the right path to kind of discover the unique pedagogies of each place. Okay, so as Angela said, we were lucky, I think, to, of course you have to have some luck in getting ARC grants. Um, they're very hard to get. <coughs> So anyway, we got a grant, um, and the grant is following up on what's happening in terms of pedagogy and children's learning at these centres. But it centres on a particular idea. It's up there as Perishivanya, a Russian word. Um, and it basically means um, emotional experience. So one of the things that we will talk about in a minute when we talk about is the way that children on these excursions to these places do experience quite emotional moments as they walk through the forest or wherever they are. So Perishivanya, as emotional experience, seemed to be a relevant theoretical concept for us. So Perishivanya can be seen as moments in life that make a difference to how you see yourself. 
could think of your story as a person, as a series of parish of onions, really significant moments that made a difference. And because we'd already come to understand that when children go on excursions, they do have these emotional moments, we thought, well, maybe they are significant for them and they could be built on in terms of what teachers do in the classroom. So if they're going on excursions, they're having these emotional moments, how could that be used as a pivot to literacy? How could teachers take these moments and build on them and get children really motivated to want to tell the story about those experiences? So that's what we're doing at the moment. We're um, looking at children going on excursions. And just last week, um, I was quite anxious because I had to go and interview for preschools. So normally I'm dealing with large groups of adults, you know, two or three hundred people in an auditorium, and I just felt a cold sweat run across me, and I thought, I actually have to go and interview these little ones, but how am I going to do it? Well, luckily I do have grandchildren, so I had a little bit of a sense of that. But um, we weren't sure what we were going to get from the kids in the prep. Is there any five? And, um, They'd been on this excursion to Harvey the bear who has to get the little teddies to want to go outside. Harvey's an inside bear. He's very scared of going outside. He needs some prep set on him. So I'm just going to give you um, a couple of examples of the kinds of things we got from these five-year-olds after they had come back to school one week later. So I was interviewing them a couple of Fridays ago. And they were so delighted about that um, excursion. They could remember it in detail. And so you'd sit down and ask them a question. They'd tell you the whole story of the excursion, like it was something that stuck in their minds. But one of the little ones I was interviewing said, I remember a rainbow winged butterfly. It was a rainbow winged butterfly with golden droplets on its wings. And I like, wow, that's like so poetic, you know? And she's just remembering this moment during the excursion. And there's clearly something that meant a lot to her. Um, they're also taking photos of these excursion moments. Um, and the photo she took was just of a nut on the ground, so very nondescript. Um, and she said, I said, oh, why did you take that? She said, well, I've never seen a green shell nut before. It's a green shell nut. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, these are the things that really capture our, our interest and curiosity. Because children read into these ordinary things quite significant things for them. You know, I've never seen a green sea nut before. So that was one kind of experience. Another one was I didn't actually interview this but Harriet, who was working with me that day, said she was asking her little five-year-old what, um, what she could remember, and she started to cry. He said, well, why are you not upset? He said, oh, the teddies, I remember, it went into my nana's bag. And it was so beautiful, and it was in my nana's bag, and I just thought it was lovely. So, again, like an emotional experience, only an ordinary thing, but she could remember some event with her nana when a teddy bear had been put into the bag and that connected to her experience on the excursion. So I guess Perishivanya are those kinds of emotional moments that we think are significant that arise for kids when they go on those excursions. And then we're interested in then how do teachers pick up on those and use them for literacy? Okay, so place responsive pedagogy. I think you probably I've talked too long on this, but basically being attentive, sensitive, and conscious. What are those unique opportunities embedded in place? And we're seeing teachers particularly as crucial mediators. So Greenwood talks about place as being profoundly pedagogical. And we've used very much Margaret Somerville's place pedagogy framework as a way of thinking about place. So first of all, we think about place as embedded stories. So 
that every place that we're in has a story to it. Who was here before? Um, how did the place become like it is? Who are the characters associated with this place? So story in place is a very central idea. Um, another idea is embodiment in place. So when you're paying attention and you're conscious and you're sensitive to place, you're aware of yourself in this place. You're aware of yourself connected to it. Um, go back to Sue's example at Baramba. When children walk, they walk down through a creek. They go along a mossy log. They go through brambles. If you think about the walking that occurs, all the different kinds of walking that occur as you go through a creek, along a mossy log, through some brambles, finally you start to head uphill, your heart's thumping, you, know, you wonder how fit you are, etc. So this idea of embodied learning is very much part of this connecting to place through your physicality. The last idea is the notion that every place is contested, and I think um, the political one that's in the news at the moment, of course, is coal versus the black-threaded finch up at the Adani mine. So that's a real kind of stark notion of contested nature of place. What is this place good for? What is it valued for? But you can think of every place as having slightly different meanings and purposes for different audiences, for different people. And so when you think about place, you always think about, there's not just one view about this place. There's a number of different views, a number of different perspectives. So that photograph from the web didn't come out too well. <laughs> but you can kind of tell that's the cover of the book. Inspiring, huh? <laughs> and these are the chapters in the book. Um, and connected to, to different places. So, one of the first chapters is about Karawatha, which is a um, forest reserve down in the Logan area. It was preserved by the efforts of some local citizens, uh, principally Bernice Fobbs who lobbied the state and council governments to preserve Karawatha. Karawatha was her backyard. She knew about Karawatha in terms of its trees. There were trees there that needed to be preserved in terms of frogs that lived in the lagoons, in terms of the koalas and the um, glossy black cockatoos that lived there. So over a period of years, she learned about her backyard. She learned about that place. She came to love that place. So she got an emotional connection to it and she decided that it had to be preserved. And through lobbying um, the state government and the Brisbane City Council and the Logan Council, they actually did preserve the place. If you go and have a look at Karawatha on a map, you'll notice that one side of it is kind of curves out a bit. That's the motorway. It's actually Bernice who got that motorway moved to go around the reserve. So it's actually, it, it's amazing to think that. And Ron told me this story that they were going to put the motorway through and um, they knew that uh, Bernice was lobbying against it. So all the dis, um, people who were planning the road came down to Karawatha, came out with Bernice and said, well, Bernice, where do you think the road should go? And she said, just there, you know, like 100 metres away. I said, no, 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 we've got to go further out. And so she walked out about another three or four hundred metres and said, OK, you can put it there. So that's how the curve got in that, in that room. So when uh, Ron does this excursion to Karawatha, a lot of the excursion is based around the story of Bernice. So the children learn about Karawatha through Bernice's story and the things that she loved and so on. Another one is Bunyaville. Bunyaville is only 15 kilometres, apparently, as the crow flies from the centre of the city. So children arrive into Bunyaville on a bus going down one of the really busy roads um, on the western part of, of Brisbane. And so they come from this very noisy environment, very fast-moving environment. They turn down a road 
into Bunyaville. And as they go along, they feel the quietness of the forest coming over them. So as they enter this place, it's very stark. The contrast between their fast-lived life, the noise, all the things that are happening, and when they enter the forest, that transition is a very stark transition. And so when they get there, they have to go on an excursion where they're moving slowly through the bush, inquiring about this and that. And so we saw the affordance of Bunyaville very much around slow time. So this sense of time when kids come there, because of slowing down, taking time. I've already talked about uh, Ramba. Maybe I'll just finish by talking about Kaluma <coughs> very briefly. Kaluma is a, a cloud rainforest in North Queensland. Um, and it's an amazing place, it's so beautiful. Um, so the cloud comes down, forest is surrounded by this uh, fog. Uh, the forest actually gets its water predominantly from that, not from rainfall as such. It actually does from the way that the water condenses on the leaves. And all the leaves are adapted to drip that water down onto the ground. Um, if you're there when the sun is rising or setting, some shafts through those foggy things, foggy <laughs> outlines. And you really need to get a sense of being in a sacred place. Uh, just the, all of that sensory information gives you, this is a really, really special place. And when the kids go on excursion there, they enter through a very old, very, very old fig tree. And you look up and you kind of have this sense that you're in a cathedral, you know? So there's, what I'm trying to paint for you here is that the affordance of Kaluma, you can learn lots of things at Kaluma about rainforest and ecology. But one of the things you get a sense of when you go to Kaluma is this sense of transcendence, of being in, in a place that's really sacred and so on. All right. Um, So those kinds of pedagogies lead to these kinds of uh, student expression. Let me just talk to you about uh, Walter. This is, <clears throat> and we've been talking about connectedness and caring. I need to tell you the story of how this image happened. So imagine we're travelling for a whole day through this forest. Um, the kids are involved in a story about this woman. Uh, they, these are, this is the moment near the end of the day. This was created probably 15 minutes before the end of the day when we're about to phone Bernice. The, the students don't know we're going to do that. So out, I will suddenly pull out the mobile or whoever's ranked will say, well, why don't we see if we can get her on the phone? To, 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 to put it on speaker, everybody gathers around. I've selected a couple of kids who might want to speak about what's happened to them during that day. But there was a little boy who was hanging back as we approached this moment, and he was scribbling something, and I couldn't work out what he was doing. He was actually drawing that. Um, and he, when he was asked later what was happening, these are his words, exactly his words. Now, the reason this is so significant is all year, this is about July, all year, the teacher, when, he, when she saw this, um, started to cry and she, just a few tears <clears throat> but her comment quietly to me was all year she'd been trying to get to this boy and something about this day got to him <clears throat> the connection with Bernice the experience and he was very very anxious to be the person who spoke on the phone and so and she was a little reserved because this wouldn't have been the child she would have chosen <laughs> to speak on the phone but he just had to and what he said was quite profound but right at the end of it he said he'd taped he'd asked somebody the teacher to tape those words and he said i'm going to play this to my mum and dad tonight they'll never believe it you know they'll never believe i did this so and what i would say though about this kind of comment and this piece of data is this is not abnormal this is normal data this is we've got heaps of this so when you give students children a deep story-based embodied connection to place, you get this kind of stuff. 
for ages we struggled with trying to figure out what this actually was. Like, is it epistemological? Is it axiology? Is it values? And we've come to the conclusion, all of the data now we see, it's all ontological. It's all identity data. It's all kids talking about who they are in the world. And so when you give them this kind of experience, this is the kind of data you get. So it doesn't fit into any of the learning areas in actual fact because it's about them and who they are in the world. Here's another one. Um, so you saw connection. I mean, what a beautiful image that one of the vines going out is around connection. But here's a year five student. And here we see that her sense of connection led to this beautiful way she describes curiosity. It just came. Like, what an amazing image is that? Like, all we did was set up the opportunity. Sure, again, through story and uh, through embodiment. And they were in a story of contested nature of place. Um, and the curiosity just came. I don't know what happened here, but anyhow, you can still read the words. You've got here a sense, if you just want to read that, you've got here a sense of the change that's going on for these students. Peter, you might want to comment on the last one. But you can see in the first two that they're aware, these children are aware, because often when we work with these students, we will ask them what's changed for them. How are you different now than when you came? And I wouldn't have believed initially that large change could happen in a day, but I've changed my mind on that. It can happen in a day. It can happen in a moment. And Parish Joanna explains this. Um, and you can think in your own life of there have been moments where things changed. And it's because of what happened in that moment and how everything came together. Um, so but you were, you were involved with this child, this last statement. Yeah, so the last one um, is a comment. So in that uh, peak, um, Ron and his colleagues um, the students to write a letter to Bernice at the end of it and they collect this kind of data all the time so as long as they, these are selected out to be just one occurrence you know this is quite a common thing and what really interests me about the last one is um, I mentioned it before the way children often make connections beyond the experience in the excursion so writing to Bernice this uh, student begins to think about her life, about a hard life, but not as hard as others. So in that moment in Karawatha, I was reminded of the beautiful things and people that life has given me. So um, this, I'm starting to think, is a kind of phenomenon of going on excursions into natural places. We often see, like, there's another example from um, a PhD student, Marcelo, Ramos, who's collecting data on children and reflecting back on the excursion. And one of the images he has is of a, a student sitting on a branch in Pullman Pullman Creek. They're just sitting there, nothing you would think is going through their mind. But she was actually thinking a lot of things. She was thinking that I don't go on excursion so much with my dad anymore. I never met everybody in my family. I always thought I'd meet everybody in my family, but it doesn't, it's not like that. You know, these are reflections on life in general. So the moments on the excursion are not like, oh, this is an interesting branch. <laughs> it might be this is an interesting branch, but it seems that it is associated with connections out into how they're thinking about themselves more in general in their life. You might just like to glance through that. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the kind of data we get. This one's pretty deep. Something was really going on for this kid um, and this student. But that's, this came out of that same Karawatha experience. So let's, let's go back to this idea of disconnection, this research idea of disconnection and connection and care. You know, when you're doing research, questions always arise. Uh, questions you're not expecting, but a question that has interested us for a, quite a while now is this one. Sure, it works in these centres, okay? It's obvious. You take kids out into these places, you do this work with them, teachers who do all the work to get there, it's obvious that something's happening to these kids. But is this transferable? Can this go back into a school? <clears throat> Particularly in terms of learning for connection and care. And then a second question, has come up for me. I've been at Peak a long time, 37 years. It's been my life work. 
So this, the big question for me is how can, these, how can that focus be reversed rather than think of excursions? How can we think of these centres as mediational tools that can actually help this happen in a school? Um, how, are we even touching the power of these centres and what they could be? And so the question is that how might a centre work with a school to actually get this kind of pedagogy happening? So I just want to share with you now a story uh, that happened uh, for me with a particular school. We've been working with a heap of schools, a number of schools around this idea, but there's one story I'd like to tell you now. Uh, the project became known as the Sense of Place Project. And it started with a school principal phoning me and saying, I've got a real problem in this school. I, I'm not interested in you. I know you. We knew each other from the past. Not interested in a curriculum solution because that's not the solution here. I've got a whole lot of really disengaged kids. I've got cynicism in the senior school. The, the kids don't really value. They're not appreciative of the school. I, I think that this approach you take might be able to help. How could we work together? And so that was where we started. It's an ordinary looking school. But we're place responsive educators. So the problem we had was how are we going to take these year sevens, and that was some pretty tough year sevens in this school, uh, how are we going to get them interested? How are we going to reconnect them? How are we going to give them Parishavanda experiences of their ordinary school that they already think they know? How are we going to do that? So the first thing we did was we just spent some time in the school and we looked around and thought, well, what have we got here? Well, we've got trees. We've got this tree. But there were seven trees, seven beautiful fig trees running along the side of the oval. And we thought, that looks pretty good. That's got potential. Um, but as we always do, if you're going to do place work, you have to know your place. And you have to know the stories of the place. We knew nothing about this place. So we started to talk to people, ask people, and nobody knew much about the place. Nobody knew anything about the place because everyone had been transferred and they were coming and going. It was just the context, but you know, why would we know about those trees? Why would we know about this place? But there was one woman and through an Aboriginal elder and this Indigenous woman in the library was a teacher aide, out of nowhere, and this is how it always happens, this place responsive work, this story just comes out of nowhere. And it's the story of the seven fig trees. They were all planted many years earlier um, in memory of some children in the school who tragically died. Nobody in the school knew anything of this story. So we thought, wow, we've got a powerful story here. What do we do with this? We decided not to focus on the tragedy, but we decided we would use the story of the trees, of the fig trees, to get our connection point. So that's where we started. But we then needed a means. We needed a pedagogical process that would allow these kids to embody, to connect, to do something with these trees. So what would we use? So, I don't know if you've heard of the Diddy. Um, has anybody heard of this? Okay, so you need to go and Google it if you don't know anything about it. Uh, it's an amazing um, thing. Miriam Rose is an elder in the Northern Territory at the Daly River. We've been in contact with her for a number of years. Um, we have permission to use the Diddy. I'll tell you what it is in a moment. Um, one of my staff has just been and spent um, seven days walking on country and, well, profound is the only experience she can use for what happened to her. So this whole idea of Miriam Rose, she's a principal. She works around Australia. She's the most incredible elder. And what they're doing in that community up there is mind-blowing, really. Um, and Miriam Rose's idea is this, Dad Diddy, this is my people's gift to you. She wants to give this gift to Australia. And there's a fabulous film being made at the moment on her life and what she's offering. So we thought, this, we'll, we'll try the Diddy. Well, what is the Diddy? Well, you can do it with me. Could you all put your fingers up like this? Come on, you can. I'll be the teacher for a moment, not the researcher. Put your, okay, say it with me. The Diddy means to listen with my ears, with my eyes, with my skin, and my heart. That's it. That's the Diddy. So we thought we'll teach it to these kids. We'll teach them the Diddy, and we'll go exploring out here and we used the story, and that got them. The story of the trees just <laughs> hooked them. But then we didn't want to dwell, as I said, on the tragedy of that. But it, we knew at that moment, the moment we told that story, suddenly these little disengaged eyes just went, huh? and you could just see, right, at this moment we have these children. And so we then had to build on that idea. We left that story, but the idea was these are special trees. So we just used that story to say these are special trees. You might think you know these trees, but you don't. 
there's a lot more to these trees than meets the eye. So let's do some exploring. Let's use some DD. And this is what one of the teachers from Peak, this was just a, in an interview with her, and I think go to the last line, it was through the peace and quietness of the attentiveness that something changed. Um, can I just say, this was no easy gig. It took a long time for these kids to trust us. We only came in one day a week for a couple of hours, and it took a long time. Um, and the teachers we were working with were incredible. So it wasn't us that did this, but it was a partnership between the principal, the teachers, and us, and we took these kids on a journey. And we looked at detail, we got involved in the place, and we came to this critical transition moment where too much detail to tell you all the things we did with them, but we got them to a point where they were willing to go somewhere with us and with their teacher. So we asked them to represent that in some way for us, and this is what one child came up with. So I thought, we just thought that was pretty neat. And then we got to this idea because we had been exploring stories, the stories of that place, what were, what, what were they, the lost stories, and together we came up with this idea that we were becoming story trackers. And it was, a, it was an appropriate moment to introduce this idea. And it kind of grabbed their imagination a bit, this idea that we were tracking stories, well, because we'd been talking a lot about Indigenous culture, we'd been talking about the notion of Aboriginal trackers, and so this idea of tracking, that's what we were actually doing, became significant for these kids. And now I have to do a little twist. Simultaneous to this, there was another project we're involved in. So over here we're in the school, it's the Sense of Place project, and we're doing all this Dididi stuff with the kids, and slowly there's progress being made. Over here we're working uh, for the local council, and we're developing a program for them in a local park, because they have a problem there, someone's poisoned some fig trees. Oh, there's an interesting connection, fig trees, fig trees. But isn't it amazing, we hadn't made the connection, we were doing these two separate projects. And then it became, and that, the, this council had asked us to write a story about this park that might engage some kids who happened to be the same age group as the kids we were working. Still, we hadn't made the connection. We were running these, and I was running them in my head as two parallel projects. Um, and so, whoops, we wrote a story called Following the Fix. And it was, I must, some sort of fertilization started to happen. We were wanting to put characters into this story that would relate to local kids. So we started to use um, consciously in our own, we didn't tell the kids this, but they started to become our source of information about what kind of kids to put into this story. Um, so we had, here we had the school, here we had this project, and then it was just serendipitous that at the moment when we needed to pilot it, we needed some kids and it was, well of course, <laughs> here they are, why don't we get these children because this park happened to be within walking distance of the school. Just luck, basically. Um, but we didn't want this new project to overrun what was happening in the school. We didn't want it to start to run the agenda of what was going on in the school. So we did a little twist and we decided we would take the kids to the park, go through this process, use this same story, uh, but we would suggest that it was a way of them practicing these story tracker skills that we were talking about in the school. And so on we went. This image is significant in this whole big story I'm trying to tell you here. Um, it happened on the second, with the second group of students who'd come to the park. It's significant because of the way Madeline has placed her hands. What she's actually saying is, there are two parks here. There's the one here that you can see, that everybody thinks they know, and there's this other hidden park. This came out of the day before this image was taken, when we were with the kids going through, trying out this excursion that we were going to run for this council. And we were sitting under the shade of a big tree and one of the boys who was in the group said, it's like those people out there can't see us. Look, they're just walking past on the way to the cafe. Uh, it's like we're invisible to them, like we're in another park, another world. And then it just hits, that's it. This idea of the two worlds, that's what we're in here. We are searching for this second world in this park, the hidden stories, the lost stories. Because the other thing that had struck us right at the beginning of the project with the council was that when we asked everyone what was significant about this park where these fig trees have been poisoned, nobody told us about all the interesting places in the park. They told us about the cafe, the zoo, 
the playground and just the gardens and yet there were all these other, there was an amazing ridge there with all these ancient fig trees and nobody mentioned it. But when we went walking we found these other places, there was this whole hidden world that the city, even the council seemed to be blind to. And so these children came on this journey with us and this notion that there were two worlds became quite significant. So if it's true in the park, I wonder if it's true in the school. And so because this idea had come from the students themselves, while we were in the park we were searching for stories and this was a really significant part of the story. We gave these kids journals and I must say I've never seen anything like it. They became obsessed with these journals. It was like we'd given them gold. Some of the parents were telling us that the children were sleeping with their journals, taking them to bed. Uh, and I couldn't quite get my head around that for a while, but I don't know if you picked it up, but did anybody notice the little girl Cassie? I, didn't, I hadn't, didn't have time to tell you the story. That image of Cassie sitting in the tree. Do you see that she's got a journal in her hands? So this whole story of Cassie, a child who'd been bullied, who'd found sanctuary in the park. This is running over here in the project with the council. This story then became reflective of the children's own lives and we realised that the two projects were in actual fact one project. So they'd simply gone on this excursion to get themselves re-engaged with their own school and everything revved to another level. Once we had this idea of the two parks and then we simply said to them, well if there's two of those, are there two of these in your school? I wonder what it is. That's your job. And off, they were off and running. And as they left, that's what they went back with. So just to finish off this little session, just have a little read through of the kind of things these kids said at the end of the project. And we have lots of this. Now the point I'd make here is these were, the these were the students who at the beginning were highly disengaged, didn't want to be part of this. The last quote is from a boy who was the leader in one of the classrooms and was, I would say, if not antagonistic, certainly very resistant becoming part of this project. And it took a long time to win that boy over. It's a big story about how that happened. Um, the one about the stories, that every single piece of grass has its own story. I can still see this little boy being interviewed because at the beginning of the interview, he very honestly told me, he's a very smart kid, he told me that he had decided right at the beginning that he was going to destroy the story tracker thing. He was going to make sure it didn't work. Like he was really direct about it. I said, really? Well, why were you going to do that? Oh, because I thought it would be boring. And then we had a bit of a conversation about why he changed his mind. Like this, I must give the credit where the credit's due here. It's not just what we were doing. It was this, these amazing teachers we were working with and what they did. And we could get into all the pragmatics of what had to disappear in the school for this to happen because we had a principal in this school who protected the teachers and said, right, forget that, forget that, forget that. This is more important. We can't do everything. That's right, you can't do everything. So we're not going to do that. I don't care what the regional director says. We're not going to do that. Right, principal. That's why this worked. Um, and then maybe read through that to see what the teacher said about what had happened. So what I learned out of this, um, as a principal of an environmental ed centre but also as a researcher, is the power of when one of these centres can actually work in partnership with leadership teams in a school, with kids. There's a lot of other big questions about the resources and how it got paid for. We won't go there because this is a research forum. But there's a lot of practicalities about how, this, how we pulled this off and how we managed to make it work. But I love the very last statement here and I can still see this teacher talking to me and saying how it made her heart sing and what these kids were able to achieve. And right at the end we had this celebration and we didn't ask them, we didn't give them these words. Right? But the idea that had caught the imagination of the children was this idea. It's put so beautifully by this group of students. They were asked to represent what the whole experience had meant for them. We created a massive big joint piece of art and that's what it meant. That was the message that that year seven child was sending out to you and me and everyone else.
And they, a lot of these kids were from very disadvantaged homes. You've probably already picked up that little undercurrent of that, the school that we were working in. One of the poorest, most disadvantaged schools in the state. And the big thing that came out of all of this for me were these, the design principles, because we realised that what we had, what we'd been working through and intuitively following, there was a pattern here, there was a way to do this. How do you design place responsive pedagogy? You follow those seven principles. That's what you do. It can't be hurried. What's the genius of place responsive pedagogy? That it's so rooted, so embodied, it's such a storying approach. It deals with the contested nature of place. It's real. That's its power. It's very, very real. And it engages disengaged students. There's no question about that. And you can see all of those, but you need, and we're using this at the moment. We're, we're the way, um, and this is not research, research, but I'll just give you a little hint. We're doing a lot of work now for outside agencies, and we're making quite a bit of money out of that, which means I can take my staff off teaching core programs and replace them with other staff who are being trained up and yeah we charge a thousand dollars a day per teacher to do that so if they're willing to pay that good and then I'll use the TRS to employ somebody else but the realize the reason this is so significant is we're using this exact design process to do this in other places so we're working for other agencies and we're creating some pretty amazing programs for them so Peter you want to finish off Oh, there's a lot of economic implications behind all this. <laughs> a lot of wheeling and dealing. Um, yeah, so I guess um, you know, the question is, you know, how do you get this right? Because you're trying to to work through today was to look at um, place responsive pedagogy, where it, where it emerged for us, and that was um, in looking at excursions, particular really closely designed ways that children could connect to place. And these, these are carefully crafted design pedagogies. Um, and we know they work. And I guess the challenge is then to say, well, okay, you can go to a beautiful place like Karawatha, you can take the children on excursion, we know that they're connecting. But I guess then what Ron was doing was saying, well, how do you take that and you work with it in your own school context? So we don't see this as a kind of just a separate pedagogy over on the side, but it can become uh, a pedagogy that's useful in every place. Because the other reflection is about the holistic nature of education, and I think you get a sense that there's a return to concern about that um, after we've been through, you know, a couple of decades of a more reductionist approach test-dominated approach to education. Um, and when I'm teaching postgraduate students, I often use the work of Gerd Biesta, a philosopher of education, to think about the multiple goals of education. So he talks about qualification, qualification being a goal that's related to knowledge and skills, and the curriculum is very much directed, and actually rhetoric is very much directed at this notion of knowledge and skills for the 21st century. And so you can get kind of caught up in thinking about education simply as this kind of very technical kind of process. But um, Biester also talks about subjectification or the development of the self, that sense of yourself, your capacities, uh, your values, and I think uh, he calls this uh, subjectification. I think you can see how this place responsive pedagogy is very much about that through attentiveness, through dadidi, um, children becoming aware of themselves, their capacities. Um, and the last is socialization in Gert Biesta's scheme, which is about connecting to your community and seeing yourself as part of a larger whole. And, um, we have to begin to think of our community as much broader than the simple human beings are sitting in this, this place today. So our community extends to, to the planet, to the more than human world, because if we keep putting humans at the centre of everything, then we can't see how that is distorting the nature of the world that we live in, the connected world. 
or our well-being is related to the well-being of everything around us. So when, uh, I don't know that Gert Biesta talks about community in that sense, but I think um, given the kind of era that we're in and the crises we face, it's important that we begin to see ourselves in a broader community, human and well -being. I think that's probably a bit we're done. Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful comment, yeah, thank you. So, the notion of, of looking at the building environment, um, what are the stories there, who was there before us, um, what did they value, and so on. Yeah, that kind of history is so important. Well, I was thinking of Ron's centre at Kulumba, which is actually a reservoir of, of heritage buildings that during that era when things were done from the side, um, some of those buildings kind of turned up at Fullenvale. <laughs> Not exactly sure how they got there. Rick, Rick got another building. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't go through a kind of bureaucratic process. So it's all legal. So, it. oh, we've, got no, a, no paper. we've got another heritage <laughs> building. Can we, we move it to Fullenvale? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think our history, as you say, caught up in these sacred places is really important to acknowledge. Um, I guess one of the things we're trying to do at the moment is to break down these divisions and boundaries between things. Um, and so not trying to set up contrasts all the time between nature and, and the human world, like they're interpenetrating all the time. Um, everything around us has been part of nature, <laughs> including the bitumen. Um, and the, uh, the, the nature of concrete, you know, and so on, takes on things that we're living. So I think understanding these connections is really important. So, Ron, you're... Yeah, well, I have a son, understand. my youngest son's an architect, so it's and a sustainable kind of architect. So, like, it's very relevant, I think, in terms of the whole life of livable communities, livable cities. Some of our cities aren't livable, some of our places aren't really that connected, but it's possible it's possible. So we're talking here about relational learning and relational system. We're talking about meaningful human, natural relationships being together and, where, and how that might relate to a space where we all want to live and where we all do the... I think it's really relevant. I think it's the same thing. And this, I mean, the key ideas of place response and pedagogy, I, I love those ideas of storing, embodiment and contested nature of place. Like, that's it. You take those three principles and you start to construct a pedagogy around it, you get really powerful learning going on. So, you were going to ask a question. Not really. It's not really. How would you answer that? Um, 
Yeah, there hasn't been a focus, I guess. One of the foci, one of the foci though, has been this notion of um, access for people with disabilities for some of these experiences. So um, a lot of the places that people go to expect people to be able to walk, uh, access it. So there has been a focus on how do we engage Sort of this isn't really answering it directly, but, but one of the things is that seeing connections between the local and the global all the time, connections across space and time, is really important. Um, so, I mean, even look at the, the places in North Queensland, when you look at, well, who was there to begin with, you know? So you can look at, at people from South Sea Islands, you look at people, indigenous people who were there, people of Italian heritage and so on. These are the people whose lives developed a lot of these these places. And so connecting through the history mm. of a place, you're going to connect to the to the multicultural background. I think an interesting idea is when you're going with the place, you're not starting with the culture, but everybody's sharing the place. And it's, it gives you an interesting perspective. So I'll give you an example. We're working with Mulpera. Hi. So we have students, some of these students are new to Australia. And so we use the Karawatha setting and we use the whole idea of Bernice as an advocate, as somebody who had a dream. So we twisted a little bit for those students and asked them what their dream is and asked them to talk to us about who their advocates were and how they got to Australia. And we welcome them and say, well, your gifts to this country, now what, what are you bringing? And we have this whole dialogue around but the, the place itself becomes the context for that dialogue. It's kind of interesting when we first entered, and this is what got me into this kind of thinking, you would think that you've got, you've got some people here and you want them to understand each other. We were involved in a whole of values work years ago. You might think the thing to do is focus on their relationships, but we chose not to do that. We chose to give them a common experience of the place. And as the focus went off them, and went on to the place. And so the question wasn't, who are you and how, how do you get on with each other? The question was, what is this place? What are the stories here and how do you relate to this place? What was most amazing about that was by giving our attention to the place, the relationships over here started to improve. Like in all the groups we worked with, teachers were saying, there was something strange going on here. The more this group connects using, and we were using, we called it profound attentiveness at the time, not the Didi. Um, the more we focused them on and the more they got into creating their, their own personal stories of the place and then sharing them, it started to create this, I would call it a culture of attentiveness and connection. Just, it was the byproduct, whereas, um, when we got that original funding for the values work, the brief was, you have to teach, that was John Howard stuff, you have to teach values. And when we put in our submission, um, we started by saying, we aren't going to teach values because we don't think you can teach them. But we're going to teach this. We're going to teach connection to place. And we think out of that will come something else. And so in a way, and I've learned this by working with the Milpera kids, and they have completely different responses to this place because it's, it's not their home. They're new here, and yet when, when they become connected, a whole lot of other stuff starts to happen. And in a way, the place allows the coming together to occur. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it works. It works beautifully. And it's a, it's a neutral in a way, yeah. Everyone has stories, everyone has places, every place is laid with contested, it's everywhere. This is a global concept. And what you're doing locally, what you're experiencing locally are all the issues that the earth is, everyone's facing, but you're just experiencing. So I think the trick is to make that link so you don't get into this parochial, like, place-centred, because that's the power of place responsiveness, is that it's so real and rich and authentic. It's also its weakness because it's not easily transferable. You can't just pick it up and go, oh, well, we'll go and teach this in Singapore. Well, no, we can't teach it in Singapore until we know the place. So we've got to go and spend time where you want to teach this. So that's its weakness, but that's also its power. So that's how I would describe it.
Australia and Queensland specifically, we're seeing that the construction of schools is increasingly outsourced to the construction and the maintenance of schools. Mm. And um, while well, concrete might commit us to nature and have stories of its own, um, I think sometimes there are problems associated mm -hmm. with, um, and it's usually economic reasons that ends up with schools being built with boxes and you know, landscapes. Maybe the, the traces of the stories being erased. Mm, vertical schools, for instance, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, um, I wonder what your, your thoughts are on, on that kind of complex uh, state of play that we're seeing around the world. Do we have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you obviously raised an important issue. Mm. Um, I noticed uh, artificial grass being very common, <laughs> and you can see why in a way. Sure. Uh, there is. Um, Increasing lack of opportunity, I guess, for for people to connect with the natural world. Um, I mean, one one of the places in the world where that's profoundly the case is is in Japan, um, in mega city Tokyo. So we had the luck to work with some people over there who were very aware of this um, issue and were mm. taking urbanised Japanese young people to the west of Japan. For excursions and to other places, you know, so that, and trying to deal with it that way. Um, but I think it, it, it's an issue. Um, there's also the development of nature schools now. I've been following that a little bit in northern New South Wales as well. Um, but yeah, access to natural places. I mean, I think we've we talk about the value of remnants, and I'm really struck by the importance of this idea now. You know, that that we're basically left with remnants of, of the vast natural world. And I think every remnant is so valuable. Let's fight for your remnants. And remnants, yeah, can be, you can also grow. You can also do things in places. You know, clever designers can do that. Yes, sorry. I'm just building on from your question. Like, there's a project, Building Future Schools. And, and it's all about teenagers. I know that the focus was the younger kids, but I'm thinking about teenagers. As a migrant here in Brisbane, I go back to the picture of the boy with the vines. Mm -hmm. And now what we see, we see high schools. They are so enclosed, not connected with the environment. And then no wonder those kids are feeling mm. dislocated. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, how could this be applied to an urban high school concept. Again, trying to... Well, nature survives everywhere. Like, so in terms of how you view place, you can view it in terms of the buildings, you can view it in terms of the blades of grass. Like, um, so I tell you, I, I went into a school where the teacher wanted us to work in this way with some older kids, older students. And I thought, how will I hook this group? and I started with the word extraordinary and asked them what the word extraordinary meant and they told me what it meant, um, that it was somewhere amazing and they told me all these places that are extraordinary and I said, well, I'd like to take you to an extraordinary place, it's in your school. So I marched them out and we were heading for what I knew, I did this on purpose, for the creek that was down behind the school, which they knew was out of bounds, but people didn't go there. Um, but as we got closer, I veered to the left and took them to this really rocky nondescript piece of their school ground with gravelly stuff and bits of rock and a few scrappy gum trees and introduced it as an extraordinary place and could see the confusion and said here's your task let's look at that word extraordinary again what's it what could it mean let's break it into two bits finding the extra in the ordinary here's your job go and find the extra in that very ordinary place this is like a metaphor i'm using here they all went off and they came back and they all found something x extraordinary like a tiny piece of red a tiny a leaf or whatever so just there's life everywhere there's life under the school buildings around the school buildings it's everywhere it's in the sky it's there's we're surrounded by it but we can't see it so this is where the Didi uh, my answer would be this is this is what it's about it's about um, and this is why I think um, Mary Clark, the biologist, is right. She, when she was asked what the core of science is, she says it's got nothing to do with the scientific method or all that stuff we describe as science. It's, there's one idea is at the centre of science. It's called profound attentiveness. If you haven't got it, you'll never be a decent scientist. 
and you'll never be a great artist. So this single idea of noticing the world, that's how I would answer the question. It, this can happen anywhere. It's a way of being. It's a way of, I guess you could call it mindfulness if you like. That's the latest buzz word around this. But it has its own history, going back into Buddhist philosophy and so on. What I love about Dididi is that all age groups, and I've worked with high school kids around this idea, when they understand what it is and that it's a gift that's come to them over thousands of years and that it's part of this country and it's grown up out of this place, they accept it. And in a way, I mean, I don't know if that answer, that's a tiny little way of saying it's, I think, part of the problem in here. Part of the problem is how we perceive of the world and how we are in the world. So, our, and I think Sengi's right, there's sustainability. He talks about the inner and outer work of sustainability. We're all obsessed with the outer work of sustainability, wind farms and all the other things. The real work is the inner work of sustainability, what's going on in here and how we actually see the world and how we see each other. So that's how I would answer that. It's a, and I think there's a way of doing that wherever you are. Because if it's not, well, then we may as well give up. <laughs> so, Ron, I was um, very interested in you and struck by the references you kept making to those wonderful teachers that you've mm. been engaging in. And I was beginning to think, what are the implications and lessons for preparation and professional development of teachers mm. if we're going to scale up this way of uh, you know, developing What grew out of this, um, these projects, we've, we've started to run a, this is very, very tiny, Alan, but we've, uh, we've started to run a course ourselves we're calling The Connected Teacher. And we said, because teachers were asking us, well, how can we do this? So we thought, well, we can't go and duplicate what we did in that school, because that was very expensive and time intensive. And so how, how do we do this? Well, we teach other people to do it. We teach them how to open their eyes and see what's right in front of their eyes and to stop thinking of their classroom as the little box they're sitting inside and to realise that their classroom is all around them. And so, um, yeah, we've... I think that, that, that could be scaled up. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, as I'm saying again, it's in here. And there's a move, I think now at this point of time with the wellbeing agenda and the whole idea of reconnecting and anxiety and all that, this might be the time for it where... Um, and it's an old idea from the 60s, because I'm old enough to remember those ideas, um, which was this notion of school without walls. So working with a group, a whole school recently, I got them all to hit their magic button on the desk. So the whole 40 teachers, and said, so, well, see what's happening? Look, the walls are all going up. They're disappearing. Now look out, what do you see? There's your classroom. So, but people are scared. A lot of teachers, they're fabulous teachers, but there is a nervousness about connecting to reality. It's much safer to stay inside. So I think it is possible to do that, yes. So but it's their own, their own child, their own ability to play and be in the world and yeah, so I've just spent the weekend with my little um, Mabel. She's just um, a year and a half old now and just I thought, well, my God, look at this. Like, you know, she's just the way she engages with the world. It's, but we all do that. I think it's a way of reconnecting to that. <laughs> Mycelia, like the fungi <laughs> filaments going through everything. Probably on the periphery still. Is it? Okay. Ron certainly comes to UQ and gives lectures to his students. And they go, some of them go to Pulumba and experience that. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking about, like, I'm trying to look at um, moments of hope around this issue. And the school strikes, I think, were. For me, at least, moments of hope. So young people seeing oh, the necessity to get actively involved. So I went to the school strike down the Gold Coast, mingled with everybody, and um, it's very interesting. I learned a lot, actually. <laughs> like, they, they had displays and things, and I thought, actually, these kids know a lot. And there were some things that I didn't know, that they had, a, they had an A to Z kind of thing about the climate and what you can do and so on. But also it was a bit disappointing in that I interviewed some of the children. I said, oh, where are you from? And they'd say to school. And I said, how many kids came for? And then I went to one big school. Well, I just asked one of the other people. She came from a school with probably 2,000. 
the students. I said, how many came from your school? One. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's like you have to realise the school strike is only involving a small number of people. But in terms of, of actually this sense of, of young people getting involved and seeing it as an issue, I mean, at least they were doing something and they were taking the initiative. So I think maybe it's just not as bad as you painted where the kids are just sort of closed in when they're in high school, that they're beginning to look out and beginning to take action. And I think that's probably what, what we need. But I, I do think that the inner, the inner work is crucial, that, that people, and I guess we're more on about the inner work, although Karawatha is certainly about advocacy. It's about children learning to advocate for those remnants that are still there. So it's not, it's not putting the outer work of sustainability away, but it is more focused on the inner. I was wondering, did you have a chat to uh, Professor Wesley Higgins at the University of Melbourne who's doing the Innovative uh, Learning Environments Teacher Change Project where they're looking at classroom design because they're looking at how teachers use that space where okay. in some cases where it's walls, even though they're physical walls, a teacher won't necessarily use that. They will think beyond that and there are those where it's open space but actually use that space as if there are walls and that might they might be a useful group to connect to because yeah, I've actually been talking to some principals about how they use space and they are looking at things like the vertical schools and those sorts of things. And that to me just seems like would be such a wonderful connection for you to look at, have a yeah. chat to them. So um, yeah, I just as soon as I heard you talking about the way teachers use space, but that ARC project would be Fantastic for Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Andrew's just uh, mentioning that the new project, Perishavania Natural Practices, is um, incorporating digital technology. So children are taking their devices on excursions, taking photos of things. And, of the paradoxical relationship between digital technology and, and nature because um, clearly the production of digital devices is a real problem in terms of the use of natural resources and the way things are thrown away. Um, it can also be a problem in terms of if you go to a beautiful place and it's absolutely gorgeous and you load it up on your social media website, suddenly you find everybody else coming to that. And so yeah, the digital technology has a, has a conflicting kind of relationship with some of the values that we're, we're talking about. But that little nut that the kid took, that I talked about, um, gives you a sense that it does become a way of focusing their attention and that becomes a kind of pivot for their thinking. Um, and so I think digital technology kind of has to be incorporated now into the way we think about environmental education because it's so so much a part of life. But what we're trying to do is to find ways where it uh, doesn't cause so much damage. Final question? Yeah, I just, I'm just wondering how much of uh, buy-in from the department do you have in terms of implementing this pedagogy across the state? I think a fair bit, actually. Well, 25 outdoor environmental education centres, that's a big buy. Mm -hmm. I think part of the answer to that is um, the department understanding what it's got in these centres, the potential, the potential of what these centres are. Because these centres, and that's what the fifth pedagogy did, that's what Ballantyne and Packard did. Um, up until that point, if you'd asked people in the department what these centres were, they might have said, oh, they're excursion centres or they're camping centres or they're residential centres. The moment that first slot of research happened, people started to talk about them as centres of pedagogy, because that's what they are. And pedagogy that cannot be duplicated totally in the school, um, aspects of it can. So I think that's what I was trying to show, that the, there can be a real partnership relationship between centres that are expert in this and are going to places. So we're marketing now our centre as come and make, make us your forest school, make us your place, make us one of your campuses. So like the school thinks, so rather than think of us as an excursion 
centre, so it's again in here. So I would call the old model the destination model. Oh, we're going on an excursion today, we go out, we do our excursion, we come back. I don't like the word excursion, I'm trying to get rid of it with the schools, the partner schools we're working with. Well, no, no, that's not what you're doing. You're coming to your campus today. This is your campus. We just happen to be your forest school campus. And when you go back into your school, your school grounds are part of your campus. And the class, so we're going out in circles, classroom, school grounds, local park come to us, we'll add another dimension to that rich place-based experience you're giving to your kids. So there are probably four or five schools who are getting that with us. It was starting to, and there are quite big changes happening. So in terms of, um, no, I'd say it's not understood well, but I think it's a big idea that could be understood. Are we unique? Are there other states that have... We are unique. Nothing, nowhere near this number.